Last week, I read to you a, uh, or I quoted to you, uh, something that Jesus said when he was doing his ministry on this earth in the Gospel of John, in chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus said, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. He was giving the illustration of a shepherd uh, in his day, how a shepherd guarded and provided for and took care of sheep, versus a thief who did not own the sheep, but would come and try to take them away for his own purposes to eat himself. And Jesus was using that as an illustration to contrast how, what he was doing for people, laying down his life so that people could have life to the full, so that they could have freedom, so that they could have satisfaction, so that they could have security, versus what other people who came before him did, who were promising all those things, but would not deliver on them. We talked about, I talked about, how there are many examples of people who make promises about freedom and satisfaction and security, but then don't deliver on those promises, and in fact, can even con you, suck you in to making decisions or going down a path that ultimately hurts you, that steals and kills and destroys. But I also said that the one who is the best example of that, who is the, the, the ultimate thief, is the devil, is Satan, is this fallen angel, this dark power who is behind and operating through the world like a puppeteer and who tempts us and who intimidates us into going in directions that are just going to hurt us. His objective, his endeavor, is to make things go bad on this planet. That's what he did to our earliest parents, our, our earliest human ancestors, Adam and Eve, and that's what he's been doing to people ever since. His desire is to set up a kingdom that is anti-God. And so all that God is about as goodness Satan wants the opposite. He wants evil and he wants to crush God and break God's heart. He can't do it, but he can make God sad by taking us, whom God created in his image, and stealing us from God to kill and destroy our lives out of spite against the God who is going to come and judge that wicked one someday. And so we've been talking, beginning last week, with the various ways that the thief the devil tries to steal and kill and destroy your life. And how, by following Jesus' way and by trusting in him, we can have life to the fullest. How we can defeat the thief and safeguard and grow life to the full. So this week, what we're going to talk about is how the thief paralyzes us with fear. The thief paralyzes us with fear. He wants people to be afraid and so afraid that they're locked up. They are prevented from doing a good thing and they are afraid to change their course from doing a bad and destructive thing. The thief paralyzes us with fear. And first we're going to look at how the thief defeats you and then principles for how you can defeat the thief. The thief paralyzes you with fear. Fear is what you feel when you expect loss or pain. This is a very important point. It's foundational to everything I'm going to talk about today, so I'll say it again. Fear is what you feel when you expect loss or pain. Fear is about expectations. Fear is about your prediction of the future. It is when in your mind, as you're looking at circumstances, and you're sorting those circumstances that you're in through your experiences that you've had up to that point, you make a prediction of what is going to happen if those circumstances don't change. And when you expect loss or uh, when you expect pain, especially when you think there is loss or pain coming and I can't escape it, I can't get out of it, then the emotion that you feel inside yourself is fear. 
So the emotion of fear is based on belief about your future. The emotion of fear in your, in your heart and mind is based on your expectations of loss or pain that you are going to experience that you can't get out of. Anxiety is what we call low-grade or chronic fear. So fear that hasn't quite reached the level of heart palpitations is low-grade, right? Or fear that sort of exists sort of as this everyday sort of thing that is sort of constantly in our bloodstream and we can't really get out of it. That's what we call anxiety. Anxiety is low-grade and chronic fear. When you think that loss or pain is, is not certain, but it is likely, that's what we call worry. Worry is when you think, well, I'm not positive that this is going to go bad, but it probably will, and I'm afraid that it might, and I'm not really sure one way or the other, and I'm in suspense about whether this thing is going to go bad. That's when you have this thing going on in your mind and heart called worry. So fear, anxiety, and worry are all related things. They're all about the expectation of loss or pain. Human beings have fear actually for our own good, for our own benefit. We have the capacity for fear in order to preserve our lives, especially when we don't have time to think things through. There are certain situations that a human being can get into that are truly dangerous, where our life is truly threatened. And fear helps us to make the right decision to get away from or to deal with that dangerous circumstance before it gets us. Fear is designed to spur us into snap decisions for our survival. Because when fear ratchets up to a high level in our, in our minds, Thought shuts off. Th actual rational thought, thinking things through, shuts off. Our brain becomes incapable of actual thinking. It shuts down and we respond instinctively and immediately and automatically in one of three ways. Fight, flee, or play dead. Those are the three things that we do, right? And we share this with all animals that are larger than insects. And heck, maybe we share it with insects too. But we know we share it with birds and reptiles and mammals and maybe even fish. Because what happens is that when fear kicks up to a certain level, we do one of two things, right? The animal that, that sees another animal coming, if that animal thinks I am at least as strong as that other animal that's a threat, then it bares its teeth and it growls and the hair stands up and it gets ready to fight, okay? But if it sees the, the threatening animal coming and it thinks, I am not as strong as this animal here, then it flees, right? It runs. It takes off. Maybe I can outrun this thing. But if it thinks, if it looks at this dangerous animal coming and says, I'm not strong enough to beat it and I'm not fast enough to run away from it, then let me just surrender and play dead and maybe it will lose interest. And so what happens is the muscles in the body just lock up and freeze. The, the animal might be thinking, I want to get out of here, but it can't. It's just boom. And of course, we call that playing possum, right? Opossums, they can't fight anything, and they're not fast enough to run away from anything. So they just boom, play dead. That's, God, that's how God made them, right? That is their defense when there is a threat. And human beings have this same thing. I mean, if you're encountering a dangerous situation, you're going to do one of those three things too. You are either going to fight it, or you're going to run from it, flee from it, or you're going to surrender, play dead, cry for mercy. Hopefully, maybe it'll leave me alone, or at least I'll, you know, maybe it'll beat me up or something, but I will survive. You lock up, you freeze. Now, the huge difference, though, between the rest of the animals and ourselves is that other animals only respond this way when their biological life is threatened. Like when their actual like, heart pumping, lungs going, when, when that is threatened, that's how they respond instantaneously without thinking about it. Human beings respond that way not only when our biological life is threatened, but when our self is threatened when our ego is threatened, when our possessions are threatened, when our reputation 
is threatened, when our relationships are threatened. There's all kinds of other threats to us because we're bigger than the animals mentally and and as persons. We're bigger persons than animals are. There's all kinds of other ways that we perceive threats even when our physical bodies are not in any danger whatsoever. So when somebody calls you a name or when somebody disrespects you, then what do you do? Right? What happens? Rational thought shuts off, and what replaces it either, I'm going to fight, so I'm going to speak something hurtful back to that person and show him what's what, or I'm going to flee, I'm going to keep my distance from this person and avoid this person as much as I possibly can, or I'm going to play dead. I am going to act, I'm going to smile. I'm going to act like this is all fine. This doesn't bother me. And and maybe if I just make this person feel better and not be so upset with me, then everything is going to be okay. Does any of this sound familiar to anybody? We do it many, many times every single day. We do it not only when the threat is there, but when we anticipate that the threat is coming to cut off that threat before it happens. Like, uh uh-oh, so-and-so is in a mood today. Everybody keep your distance. What are we doing, right? We are responding with flee, you know, or if if she says that to me again, she's going to get an earful. We're preparing to fight, right? We, we, We are already setting that up. And so when fear kicks in, rational thinking shuts down. And the more insecure yourself is, the more that that you are threatened by what other people say and what other people do and the circumstances of your life, the more insecure yourself is, the more fearful you are. And the more fearful you are, the less you think things through. And the less you think things through, the less you make good choices and do what's right. And the less you do what's right, the worse things go in your life. And this is why the devil likes fear so much. This is why the devil wants you to be afraid. He wants you to be afraid because he wants to ruin your life. He wants you to be afraid because he knows that when you're afraid, you don't make good decisions. And bad things happen like on those commercials they used to have about the person who had cable instead of direct TV. Do you remember those commercials? Some of you remember those commercials, especially people who watch sports, right? Like you have cable and therefore there's this chain of events that happens that ends up with you selling your hair to get away from Vegas, right? Or, or getting beat up on the subway or, or all the various hilarious things that happen in those commercials, right? That's, that's what he wants to build that chain into your life. And, and by making you consistently afraid, he sets you up to make bad decisions so that those things happen. Being driven by fear in our activity is a bad way to live your life. It's a bad way to live your life. So again, what is fear? Fear is what what you feel when you expect loss or pain. So the way that the devil wants to paralyze you into making bad decisions is by getting you to expect loss or pain. By getting you to expect loss or pain all the time, or by taking the losses and pains that you can reasonably expect and blowing them way out of proportion so that the loss seems absolutely unrestorable or the pain seems absolutely unbearable and therefore something to be feared. The the devil is the one who convinced the human race to get into our insecure position. The reason that you feel threatened is because you live in a fallen world. The reason that you feel like you could lose everything if you lose your job is because you live in a fallen world where you have to work by the sweat of your brow in order to earn enough to get some bread to put it in you to to get up the next morning and do it again. That's the the conditions of the fallen world, right? The reason that you're, you're threatened about what somebody else is going to think about you is that as a result of the fall of humanity into sin, you don't know what you think about yourself. 
You don't have a view of yourself that lines up with God's view of you as somebody who's created in his own image, right? So you are insecure. You're afraid of what other people think of you. You're afraid about losing your possessions. You're afraid about broken relationships because you live in a sinful and fallen world. The devil is the one who put us into that world so that now we're exposed to fear all the time, so that we're liable to make bad decisions all the time and to act without thinking all the time. Now, if the devil can determine what we, can, what we expect, then he can make us fear. If he can get us to expect loss and pain, he can make us afraid. The devil determines what we expect by lying to us. Jesus said about the devil, he was a liar from the beginning. He's a liar and the father of lies. When he speaks lies, he speaks his native language. That's what he does. So the devil lies by either convincing you of something that is untrue. So he convinces you that loss or pain is coming when it's not. Or else he, takes you some, he, he shows you something that is true about loss or pain that is likely or possible. And he shoves it in your face but hides from you some other truth that puts that loss or pain in a different light. But either way, whether it's by telling you a lie or whether it's by concealing the truth from you, he's trying to get the loss and pain that you expect to get so huge and fill, and fill your vision that your fear ratchets up and your thinking turns off. So the kinds of lies that the devil likes to tell you are these. He likes to say, for example, your sins are too big for Jesus Christ's death on the cross to pay for. So even though you've asked God to forgive you your sins, he's still angry at you and he's still out to punish you. Or he says to you, you know, God might save you when you die, but he isn't concerned about the little details like your problems right now, so he's not going to change things for the better in your life. Or he might say, God is not strong enough to intervene. So he's not going to change things because he's simply unable to do so. There's, there's one way that, that Christians get caught in this, or at least American Christians get caught in this, that we actually talked about in uh, the growth group, the Thursday night growth group that I was leading on the book Mere Christianity. And that is this discussion about this thing called free will. Now, if you, ever have, if you ever get into a conversation with somebody about free will, you find it's a very complicated conversation. It's a very difficult sort of thing to figure out, and there's a lot of different things that people believe about it that, that are acceptable, um, but one thing that's not acceptable, it's okay to say that God allows people to have free will, whatever that means. What's not okay to say is God can't do something because somebody has free will. Like God's not able to do something because we see in the Bible all the time where God interrupts and changes people's minds. And we also see lots of places in the Bible where somebody has a bent, I am going to hurt God's people in this way, and God says, well, that's nice, you can choose to do that, but I'm going to get in your way and stop you from succeeding. So, so this idea that God is somehow unable, his, his hands are tied, he's unable to intervene is just not so. But the devil wants us to believe that. The devil will also tell a lie like, if God was planning to change things for you, he would have done so already. So he must not be planning to change things. I was just saying something about this in, uh, in, in our Sunday school class, our adult growth group Sunday school class here this morning before the worship service, where I was saying that, you know, we get these ideas in our head of how long things should take, Right? We get this idea in our head. Like, for example, a month ago, I sent an email to somebody. And at the time that I sent that email, I said to myself, you know, this person might not reply. I'm going to give them a month. And if they go for a month and they don't reply, then I'm going to assume that they're not planning on replying at all. Now, where did I get a month? I don't know where I got a month. I don't know where I came up with that figure. But somehow I had in my head, given these people and given this thing that I'm saying, I'm thinking a month is probably pretty reasonable, right? And we do the same thing with God. You know, I ask God for this thing, and given that this is my situation, and given that he's God, I think if he was planning to do something about it, he'd have done something about it in this amount of time. And we're past that amount of time, so I guess he's not planning on doing anything about it, right? The devil wants to get us to think that way. Or, for example, the devil would say to you, God never brings about a greater good on the other side of suffering. 
He never makes it worth it in the end. So avoid pain at all costs. He wants to convince you pain now is always worse than reward later, so run away from pain. Or he'll say to you, you know, God's instructions aren't really reliable. In other words, things aren't always bad if you break his rules. So if it ever looks like obeying God is going to have a bad result for you, then by all means save your own skin and don't obey him. Because you can't trust that things are going to work out if you do what God says. Or, this is the best one of all, I think. He wants to convince you what someone else would do to you if you obey God is worse than the consequences if you don't obey God. Fear of man, right? Fearing man rather than fearing God. You know, I kn- if I disobey God, I think he's still going to be okay and work things out for me. But if I cross this person over here, oh man, then I'm in for it. So, God, sorry, I'm going to have to deal with this guy because I think he's going to do worse to me than you. These are things that the devil wants you to believe. In other words, the devil wants you to be a functional atheist. He wants you to believe that there is no God or that the God that there is is not really the one described in the Bible. And if he can get you to be certain of bad things in your future, as if the real God does not exist, as if the real God cannot solve your problems, as if the real God is not going to preserve and protect you if you trust and obey him, then the devil can paralyze you in fear and use it to lock you into bad decisions and non-decisions that wreck your life. So how do we defeat him? How do you defeat the thief and overcome the stranglehold of fear. Well, there's five moves to break you out of the stranglehold of fear. Five moves to break you out of the paralysis that I want to share with you today. Most of them are mental. Move number one, be completed by God's love. Move number one, be completed by God's love. I want to read to you here from the first epistle of John, the first letter written by the Apostle John in the New Testament. This is from chapter 4 of that letter. He writes, This is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. See, the first thing that you need to get settled is that you don't have to be afraid of God's wrath because God has sent his son to prevent you from having to deal with it. God saved you himself, and God saved you from himself. Okay? You don't have to worry about, God is still angry with me, I've sinned too bad, I'm too unclean, I'm too guilty, I'm too unworthy, I have screwed up my life permanently and it can never get any better, and God is never going to allow me to have happiness because of all the things that I've done. You don't have to believe that lie of the devil if you just receive God's love. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Do you realize that in the, in the lives that we live, there are times that things can seem to be miserable, that things can seem to be hopeless, that, that things can seem like we're in, going into a bad direction and into something that we can't get out of, and we can think, God must not love me, or God must not love me as much as He loves this person over here. But I want to tell you something right now. On the cross of Jesus Christ, God settled once and for all whether he loved you. Once and for all. Like, it it does not matter. Your life from now until the day you die could be the worst, most miserable life that anybody has ever lived ever. And you could still know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God loves you because of Jesus Christ, his son, hung on the cross for your sins. Right there so that you could spend eternity in glory and joy and wonder when Jesus returns. you got to receive that. you got to know that. 
when you receive that in, when you take that in, then His love becomes complete or perfected in you. And it drives out the fear of punishment. It drives away the fear of punishment. So the first step to overcome the paralysis of fear is be completed by God's love. Know that He loves you. Now again, that assumes that you have received it. And if you haven't received it, if you haven't received the grace that's offered to you, you can do that today. You can do that today. It starts by simply telling him, God, I realize that it's my own doing things my own way that has broken me away from you. It it is my own intention to try to find happiness without you when all the happiness in the world is in you. That that's been the source of my problems. And I realize that I've not been treating you as God. I've been treating you maybe as my buddy. I've been treating you maybe as not even really there. But I haven't treated you as God. And I realize that that is the cause of all my problems and that I'm getting what I deserve. But I believe that you sent your son to put our relationship right. And so I'm trusting that his death and resurrection does it. His dying on the cross and his rising on the third day does it. So please forgive me right now. You can pray that prayer today that I just said. And that gets you started in receiving the love that he's trying to dump on you. But you have all the windows rolled up and all the doors locked to prevent it from getting in. You can open it up and receive the love and know that he is for you and not against you. Second move to overcome the paralysis of fear is to know that God is with you. Know that God is with you. And in the passage that Vinny read for us, the first couple of verses say from the Apostle Paul, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. Very famous part of the Bible, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In the fourth verse of that psalm, it says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, no trouble, for you are with me. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, that is, what the shepherd uses to fight against the wolf and the lion and the bear to protect the sheep, they comfort me. When God is with you, When God is with you, you know that that no matter what loss or pain you are staring at, no matter what loss and pain you believe to be in your future, if you know that he is with you, you know that either that loss and pain will have to flee and you'll be protected, or somehow you will be preserved as you go through that fire. The third move to get out of the paralysis of fear is to pray about everything. To pray. To pray about everything. Paul goes on to say, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying that anxiety is sin. Do not be anxious about anything. Jesus said it too. He said, do not worry. Worry and anxiety is one of those safe sins. You know, committing adultery, that's pretty bad. You know, murder, that's pretty bad. Okay, but worry, hey, you know, that's not really a big deal. Anxiety, you know, I mean, hey, what what can you do, right? If God says in his word, do not, and then something comes after that, that means if you do it, That's disobeying God. I'm just going to break it down really simple for you. Okay? So we need to recognize that if you have a worry problem, if you have an anxiety problem, you have a sin problem. You do not just have some adjustment problem. You do not just have some emotional problem. You have a sin problem. Why? Because back behind anxiety, back behind worry, is a belief about your future that assumes that God is not God. And that is sin. That is doubt. That is lack of faith. Right? As Paul said in Romans, everything that is not of faith is sin. So what is the antidote? Pray. 
Prayer is the antidote. But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Because when you pray, what you're saying is, I believe that there is a God. And I believe that that God is for me. And I believe that that God can do something about this. And that is how you overcome. Now, you may still have the emotion of fear that's kind of swirling around. But by making that decision to pray and offer that to God, you're taking a step to say, I believe. And when that happens, the peace of God that does not even make any sense to your mind or the minds of the people around you will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You might not even be able to understand how you're so calm, but you're calm because the peace of God comes and hits you. Might not come right away, might not come as soon as you say, in Jesus' name, amen, but it will come. It will happen. So pray about everything. Fourth step, fourth move to break you out of the stranglehold of fear. Fix your thinking. Fix your thinking. Paul goes on to say, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will will be with you. There's that peace again. The God of peace will be with you. See how it all ties together, right? But Paul is saying that that in order for the God of peace to be with you, think the right stuff. Think the right stuff. Get control over your mind again and think the right stuff. So how do we fix our thinking? Again, our fear comes from our expectations. Our expectations are what we think. Our expectations are what we believe. How do we fix what we think? How do we fix what we believe? Two simple steps. First, you got to uncover your false beliefs. And then second, you got to replace them with the truth. You got to uncover the false beliefs. You got to uncover the things in your mind that you believe that are devil's lies, that are not true. And then you've got to replace them. You've got to knock them out and replace them with something true, with something that is in accord with reality, that's in accord with God's word. Now, this, what I just said about fixing your thinking by uncovering false beliefs and replacing them with truth, this is a huge topic right there. And to, to help you with that, I've put something on the back uh, windowsills. Actually, our administrative assistant, Ann Logue, put them on the back windowsills for me. I'm going to give credit where credit's due. They're on the back windowsills, and this is a, 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 a little learning tool on uncovering false beliefs. Okay, uncovering false beliefs. I want you to take one of those when you leave, and I want you to look at it. Now, it's got some teaching. It's got some scripture. It's got some teaching. It's got some questions. And it's got some, some steps, some assignments, some things that you can do to figure out what is the stuff that I'm thinking that's yielding these, these fears that I'm dealing with. Okay? It takes some time. It takes some practice. It's not something that you read and it changes you. It's something that you practice and it changes you. Okay? And I'm happy to talk about them with you. Once you've gone through that one, then come back to me for the sequel. I got a part two that's called Replacing False Beliefs. But that's not going to do you any good unless you uncover the false beliefs first. So you take this, you work on it, then you come back to me, I'll give you part two. Okay? And, and, and I'll even coach you if you want to help to work through these things to fix your thinking. Fifth, the fifth move to break you out of the stranglehold of fear is to reignite the Holy Spirit to reignite the Holy Spirit in your life. Why? Because all these things that I've said before about being completed by God's love, knowing that God is with you, praying about everything, and fixing your thinking is something that is almost certainly too much for you to do. You are not strong enough to do it. If you were, you would have done it by now, most likely. You need a power that is greater than yourself. And God has given us that power in giving us himself in the person of the Holy Spirit. Paul said to his protege, Timothy, who is a guy who was known to be kind of afraid of some things and had good reason for it. He wrote to him, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power love, and self-discipline. That last word, self-discipline, in older translations went sound mind. 
and it's a word in, the, in Greek that is difficult for us to translate into English. But basically what it means is that you make good judgments and then you act according to your thinking rather than according to your impulses. And that's what the Holy Spirit gives. A lot of people are afraid of the Holy Spirit because they think if they receive the Holy Spirit within, he's going to make them go crazy. He's going to make them into fanatics. He's going to make them like emotionally unhinged and unbalanced and out of control. And in fact, when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, he does elevate your emotions a great deal. But he doesn't do so in a way that overrides your self-control. In fact, he does it in a way that strengthens your self-control, that strengthens your self-discipline, that strengthens your thinking. And maybe you're somebody who says, I I don't even know what this Holy Spirit is. I I don't know if I've ever received him on me. Or maybe you're somebody who you have have had the, the Holy Spirit fall upon you in power a thousand times. But either way, it's appropriate to you today to hear this message, rekindle the gift of God. Go to God and say, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit of power. Fill me with your Holy Spirit of love. Fill me with your Holy Spirit of a sound mind, of self-discipline, so that I do not walk in fear, but walk by faith. But even after all this, aren't there some things that are so scary that we can't help but be afraid? I mean, even if we know the truth, aren't there some losses that are facing us that are truly unbearable, that are really there, not lies of the devil, but they're actually real? Aren't there really pains that are so severe that we truly are afraid of them? I mean, let's face it, every one of us is going to die someday unless Jesus returns ahead of time. That seems like a pretty big loss. That seems like pretty serious pain, right? Aren't there there some things that really are there that really are that scary? Well, the Apostle Paul had things to be afraid of. He had reason to be afraid of suffering, He had reason to be afraid of imprisonment. And he had reason to be afraid of impending death. And in fact, when he wrote those words to Timothy, he had suffered severely, he was in prison, and he admits in that letter, I'm being poured out as a drinking offering and my time of departure has almost come. He knew that he was going to be sentenced to death and executed very, very soon. But what did Paul say in response to all of that? What did he say to Timothy, who Timothy was expecting? That's coming for me too, since I believe in Jesus as Lord. I'm probably going to suffer and be imprisoned and be killed, just like my master Paul was. Paul said this, The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Because see, when you see things from God's point of view, then even real losses and real pains, and real things to be afraid of are temporary. They're temporary. They do not last. Sometimes the way God preserves and protects us is not by shielding us from those things that we fear, but by walking through, with us through the fear to the glory on the other side. You can have that hope today if you place your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. I'm going to pray right now to that end. Pray along with me. God, I pray that any person here who has not placed their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord would do so today. Would pray according to what I prayed before or at least would feel that tug in themselves that says, I need to talk to Pastor Corey. I need to talk to the person who brought me. I need to get this straight in my life. Because just being a good person is not enough. Just going to church is not enough. I I need something more. I need something more. I need to be a disciple. I need something more to happen in my life. God, I pray that you would give that person the courage to surrender to you. To play dead before you. To stop fleeing from you and to stop fighting you, but to stare you in the face and say, this is who I am, this is who you are. I need you to change who I am and forgive me. And I pray, Lord, for the rest of us, that you would put in us your truth, that you would sanctify us in your truth, the truth of your word, and that we would be changed, no longer being practical atheists, but people who know that the Lord is with us. 
that our gentleness might be evident to all. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.